Hey, Pilates Stratosphere. Great to be with you. I am here with my friend Nathan Ross Reese. Nathan, how's it going? Great, Raf. Great. It's uh, awesome to link up with you again. I'm joining you from California right now. How are you? Yeah, I am awesome. Um, had a great afternoon nap today, feeling rejuvenated, and uh, looking forward to our convo. Haven't caught up for a while. Yeah. Yep. New year. Yep. Um, so, why don't you? Um, I want to talk about your story today um, of uh, leaving, you know, going from being employed as a Pilates instructor to becoming self employed and now kind of really starting your own business. Uh, I really, one of the things I really like to do on this show is bring on people who are doing exciting and innovative uh, things in the Pilates business sphere, and you definitely are one of them doing one of the more exciting and innovative things that I'm aware of. So I'm excited to have that conversation, but um, I'd love to know, like, you're on the a tour of the US right now. So, um, yeah, what have you what have you noticed? Uh, and like, well, firstly, how many how many workshops have you done in the US so far? Done about just over thirty. So I've got another ten to go before I'm off to Canada. And so, where where have you been in the US giving workshops? Well, I um I started up in the top north east so i got into new york um drove up to boston and um i put it on instagram basically my intentions it's like hey everybody uh this is where i intend to be i'm doing a trip in america running my workshop uh within two weeks i had all the bookings organized and i tried to organize them so they'd be in like an order so i basically i started from the north east and i drove all the way down the coast down to south beach uh, Miami, and then flew over to Texas, and I've driven all out through the center, um, all out through to California, and then I'm from Northern California, I'm going back down to LA before I fly to Michigan. Um, so, yeah, I've been to a lot of different places I've never seen before. It's been it's been crazy. <laughs> right, so you've been you've been up and down both coasts and right through the middle as well. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, so what, like, what have you noticed? What have you noticed? Like, what are the differences and similarities between the Australian and US Pilates uh, scene? Uh, well, straight away, one thing that's pretty common here is that everyone likes to count. So everyone likes to try and control the speed of the movement. Um, but what I've been giving people in my workshop is saying that I prefer time goals as opposed to counting because sometimes – Moving faster makes it harder or moving slower makes it harder depending on the resistance if you're using body weight as load or spring tension as load. So um, I kind of give everyone the autonomy to move at their own speed, but I let them know exactly what's going to make it harder or not. So um, people have un- have never really seen that before. So straight away they're like, oh my God, that makes so much sense. Um, and a lot of conversations I've had straight off in my workshop have been people saying, we're just going to change to that right now. So um so it's been a real fun kind of cultural exchange of ideas basically um what i found is there's a lot of studios in isolation right now like in towns in cities that are starting to trial this model of 10 12 14 reformers plus specifically focusing on the reformers they're getting really good numbers and they're all about to open up their second their third their fourth studio in the next 12 months so this thing's about to blow up over here for sure so all they're looking for is how to do it on a bigger scale and the, the secret to doing it on a bigger scale is you need to have consistency in how you load people because you need to get progressive overload to strengthen people. And the main problem is that most studios, the instructors don't load people with the same strategy. That's why you see some classes are really hard, some classes you don't feel anything. And then even with the same instructor, sometimes they're unpredictable um, because they just don't have a, a loading strategy. So I'm just giving everyone that strategy. Yeah, that's amazing. And in fact, you know, that's something that I, I observe in Australia a lot as well is that uh, a lot of time Pilates classes are just taught kind of on an individual basis. It's sort of like, okay, I'm teaching this class today and then tomorrow I'll teach it to a different, totally disconnected class and there's not, not a sense of progression or... You know, uh, I really like what Nike and Fanny are doing in Sydney um, at Kefi Studios. Shout out, shout out to those guys um, because they do. I can't remember which days it is, but let's just say like Monday, Wednesday, and Friday is is Resistance Day, and they do progressive overload those three days, and then like Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays is like Cardio Day, and then they 
they do cardio or stretching or whatever. You know, so it's basically if you come every day, you get a complete workout the whole week, and then the next week they raise the bar up a little bit and make it a little bit harder. And then, so they've actually got a whole, you know, strategy about how to build up their clients over time with that progressive overload. So, um, could I could I jump in real quick with that? So my strategy is a little bit different in the sense that. Rather than having the exact same group of people or requiring to have the exact same group of people for a period of time, my strategy is that if you look at it basically on an exercise by exercise basis, if you start off in an exercise in the easiest version of that exercise and then within the same exercise scale the intensity intentionally on a target muscle group, that means that every level of ability will be challenged within the same exercise. So by the time you get to the end of the exercise, it doesn't matter how strong you are, if you've um, kept on stepping it up, you're going to be met with a challenge. So all they need to do is just consistently load people with have some kind of reference point. Like what's the target muscle group? What's the load? Is it body weight or spring tension? And then what's the progression strategy? And with that, it doesn't really matter who you are, if it's your first class or if it's your 20th class, you can be challenged with um, the same muscle group, same movement pattern where you're at. So yeah, that's uh, that's a slight difference there. So anyway... <laughs> Yeah, that that's great. I, I don't really see it as a difference. I just I see that as a within class strategy, and you know I think of that as layering. Where basically you start out with the easier version, then add more challenge, more challenge, more challenge until everybody's you know maxed out, and then you're done. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so all right, so it sounds like that we're really at some kind of uh, transition or inflection point with the industry over there, by the sounds of things. Would you agree? Oh yeah. Ah. Oh. Everyone is at the moment, everyone is, I think they've been doing things for a long time in a certain way, but now with the social media um, aspect, people are looking around, looking for something new, looking for a new way to reinvigorate it, to try and get, pull a different crowd. People are trying to, um, um, I suppose, find a new experience to offer. So people are starting to get creative playing with these ideas and... And incorporating other things into their studios, you know, they've got lighting systems, sound systems, you know, they're trying out different loading strategies. So people are getting out there, they're being creative with it. Um, and all they need is intention and guidance and a plan, really. And um, I've just been, it's fascinating to me because every time I teach now, I'm teaching in a brand new location for the first time and teaching people I've never met before. Every single class I teach, new city, new new studio. You know, I'm looking at different reformers I've never seen before. Everything is new. So it's like the best. I love the novelty of it. But essentially, we're all human beings and we all need to be loaded with intention. So that's what I like about it. It seems like the first principles of this idea seem to be effective in every scenario. Um, but yeah, definitely you can well, say it. That's the thing about first principles, isn't it? <laughs> that's right. Uh, but yeah, America is just about to explode with this. Um, because it's just, you can train more people at the same time. You, the, the studios make more money. Um, it's more accessible to different levels of ability. Um, there's a clear progression. So it means that it's like a really good return on investment of time and energy. Um, there's still a creative element to teaching it. So the instructors can still get professional development. So it's just, yeah, I think it's like as a model, it seems to be the most effective and I think it's going to be pretty big. Yeah, uh, I agree. And so, um, uh, let's let's uh, backtrack uh, a year or two now, I guess, to when you were. I think last I can't remember. Maybe it was the first time we talked. You were on your tour of Australia. Uh, you, you know, you were sort of in your apprenticeship phase. Then you're trying to soak up all the knowledge from all the other instructors around Australia. You went on a big big odyssey and and tour. And you did, I can't remember if you did twenty or thirty or forty you know, different studios that you visited as a, as a client. Um, and so, yeah, so then you went back to Tassie and, uh, which is kind of like the Texas of Australia. Um, uh, and in what way? <laughs> oh, it's just kind of, it's, it's down South. Um, and, uh, so then, yeah, so then you were teaching in studio and you actually moved to Melbourne for a bit and, uh, we hang out. You were teaching here in Baldwin at Sophia's studio at KX. So, 
Can you talk us through the so what I'm interested in in just exploring here is just that your transition from being employed as an instructor in someone else's studio to you know going out on your own and and now you are like fully um, creating your own you've created your own business like you've got a unique business there's no one else in the world doing what you're doing uh, and you you know very successful at it so how did you go well how did you how did you how did you make that transition from you know full-time employed teaching Pilates to doing what you're doing now yep well first of all shout out to Sophia she's an absolute legend I love her so much and um, if you want to start off with reform I definitely go see her because she'll look after you um, and I really want to promote that because there's a lot of people out there that are really great great owners to work for and she's definitely one of them um, but so my transition came from, well, pretty much living in Tasmania, the only way I could learn was to travel outside the state because there wasn't really anyone in the state which had the the experience to, to really learn from. So I kind of got used to the idea of traveling early. It was just essential. Otherwise, I'd just, if, I mean, if you put a whole bunch of new people together and no one knows what they're doing, then there's no leadership really. So that's basically how it was back then. So I was like, all right, I'm excited to learn. So I started going to Melbourne, ah, Sydney, Adelaide, and it was a lot of it was just word of mouth. I'd talk to people and be like, well, who's your favorite instructor? Why? Uh, and I'd, I'd kind of get like the crowd, I don't know, vote. Who did everyone like? Why did they like them? So instead of kind of going up some kind of hierarchy path of, of leadership, I was more like spreading myself around the ground, putting my ear to the ground think looking for like real performance, was looking for people that were seen as outstanding. And I was really curious to understand why, like what is it about them which made them so um, impressive to people? What do people love about them? So I I found it was really important. So my understanding of how reformer workouts work is basically a mosaic of everything I've ever learned from all the experiences I've ever had. And a lot of the stuff I've learned was from people that were brand new. A lot of it I've learned were people for, that have been doing it for like eight years plus. So it's all like this kind of collection of things. And uh, to answer your question, what happened was I'd, I'd get these experiences. I'd come back to Tasmania, I'd teach. It has happened again and again and again. And eventually all my classes were full all the time, always waitlisted. So I was like, well, I'm obviously doing something, right? So... I was trying to figure out, well, what is it that I'm doing now that I wasn't doing before? And I found that when I kept on going to more and more studios, I could kind of tell the things I knew and the things I didn't know. So I was kind of building up concepts in my mind of things that were important. Um, And it got to the stage where people started to invite me to go to their studios to teach them things. And after a certain period of time, I found that my ability to grow was being restricted by staying within the organization because I was pretty much breaking all of their internal rules about, you know, hierarchies and, you know, who do you learn from? Because I was pretty much my own, started pretty much started my own business within their structure. Um, so I realized that if you look at the actual entire landscape within the franchise or, or without the, or outside of it, there's way more studios outside of it than in it. So I was like, well, my opportunities are going to lie you know, doing this on my own, uh, under, my, under my own banner. And um, that was very important for me because I really wanted to have creative control. I didn't want to be censored. I wanted to say exactly what I thought. Um, and I wanted to do things which I felt were the most important and effective. So I came to a point basically in April 2022 where I was like, okay, I'm going to do this thing now. Like I'm just going to gonna. gonna announced to the world that I'm running my own workshops and see what happens. And my original plan was to try and like start and see if it would work. But I got a really big response. I got about 10 workshops booked within the first two weeks and a lot of them were in Sydney. So I just decided, well, I might as well just sell all my possessions and leave my apartment and just go because there's no point like paying rent down here and doing that at the same time. And then... I kept on, just kept on going. I haven't been back because that was April last year. <laughs> actually, do you know when I left Australia, I actually sold my car too. Like I'm like fully committed to this thing. Um, yeah. So I'll come back eventually. I have to buy a new car. But like in the meantime, like I'm pretty much 
wherever I am, I'm, that's where I am. I'm not really, yeah, scattered. That's amazing. So uh, what I what I want what I want to just remark on there is that you turned on its head. I think the 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 predominant paradigm in the Pilates world, which is basically we learn from people who are quote more senior, you know, because I've got like more qualifications, more years of experience, you know, more lineage, um, etc. Uh, and so rather than seeking out people who had all the all the all the right kind of you know, qualifications, you sort out the people who are actually producing results in terms of full classes. Like you, t- you, you deconstructed high performance and you were like, okay, who's actually, you know, killing it in this industry and how can I go and learn from them? Whether it's like their first week teaching or they've been doing it for a decade, doesn't matter. And, and so you, and then, so as you, so you really, you know, you, set out to, I mean, I don't know if this was your intention originally, but you basically set out to become the most popular instructor possible because you went and deconstructed all the most popular instructors and were like, okay, what can I learn from these people to do what they do? And it worked. You became the most popular instructor. And and then you, you know, you were going back and learning from them and it kind of then at some point it, the balance shifted and it's so you were doing more teaching than learning. You were like, oh, the, the, the apprentice has become the master at this point because those people that you'd, each you know, person you'd learned one or two things from, but you'd learned like one or two things from like 50, 100 people. And so now you knew a lot, a lot, a lot of things. And so when you, when you went back, back to that person that you'd learned two things from, now you had like 98 things to, <laughs> to teach that person. Um, so, and then in a, the second thing is like inevitably, yeah, so I guess, all right, so first, was that your intention? Like, did you consciously seek to become the most popular instructor possible or was, was this kind of just like more you know, to just kind of just go with the flow and that's how it worked out. Well, when I first started, one thing I didn't have was full classes and it just used to really piss me off. I was like, what am I doing wrong? I, what is going on? You know what I mean? I always, I thought, well, to me, like everything's under my control. So right now there's something that I'm not doing. And I'm not sure what that is. So I have to figure it out. So I was, that was my intention. I always wanted to have my classes full. I always wanted to have wait lists. I saw that as like a sign of people seeing value in what you're doing and wanting to be excited to be there. So anything less than that, I was just not going to be satisfied with. So that was probably my first motivator. And then the reality was to learn those things, I'd have to leave Tasmania and, and find people that could do that. So it kind of put me on a bit of a pathway, I suppose, to do it. I mean, pop- popularity to me means... Well, when I tried to figure out exactly what it was, which would make you popular, if you were going to put it like that, it's actually just knowing people's names, encouraging them, and getting them results. That is actually it. That's all you need to do. So if you can do that consistently, automatically you're going to have greater numbers. And everything else is just skills that help you do it better for different types of people. Um, and then diff- So that's what I found really interesting was that you'd think that if you'd, you'd chase... If you chase trying to be popular, you'd think that would be, I don't know, chasing your tail, but it's actually really, really simple. A lot of it's just to do with like people feeling connected and appreciated and that is something you can control because if you greet people warmly, you remember their names, that has a huge influence. If you encourage them in the workout, they perform better, they get stronger quicker. And then if you have a system to scale intensity so you can progressively overload people, they're going to get stronger as well. That's it. So everything else I learned in between that was just a million different variations of doing the same exercise. But what happened was after about 18 months, I remember coming back to Tasmania thinking, I'm so confused. I'm so confused because every single person I've spoken to had a different point of view. And I was like, well, who's right? Who's wrong? So I was... In those moments where I was massive confusion, I always think that whenever you're confused, you're just about to learn something. So I thought, well, what I have at the moment is I have so much information, but I have no way to prioritize it. I don't know how to assess it. So I decided that the way I'm going to prioritize all this information is what is the most effective strategy at getting results for people? That's going to be at the highest list. That's the number one priority. And everything else is going to be less important than that. So then it came down to like three things which I found every performer exercise needs, for example. Um, First one is you need spring tension, the full range of motion. Um, 
to make it effective. So the first part of that is spring tension. So if you lose tension in the range of motion, you're not going to get stronger. Um, and if you don't have a full range of motion, then it's less effective. So partial range of motion won't do is what a full range will. Um, next thing you need is a quick setup time. So transitions kill the class. If there's too many transitions, then you're not working out. You're having to have a limited time. So being able to intentionally minimize transition time has a good result on the workout. Now, if you have less transitions, you have less exercises. If you want to teach less exercises, you have to be able to control how fast people fatigue. So that now becomes like intentional skill to be able to put people in a position which is achievable and then turn the intensity up. So all these things, they're connected, what works and what doesn't work. The reason why people end up teaching too many exercises is they put people in positions where they fatigue really fast, then they're forced to change, and then there's lots of transitions, and then no one gets any results. Because whenever you look into the group class, there's always going to be a range of ability level. So you have to start at the bottom. Otherwise, if you don't start at the bottom, then you leave those people hanging out to dry. Um, and then the last one, yeah, was the ability to control intensity. If you can't control intensity, then you can't control the class. So... Um, so spring tension, the four-inch of motion, quick setup time, the ability to control intensity, basically how, how fast people fatigue. If you can do every one of those things with every exercise, the clients just love it. And they can't articulate why they love it. They just love it. And the reason is they can do everything and it felt good. Um, and notice that wasn't on that list. Things with massive complexity or massive stability challenges. No one gives a shit about that. Like what happens is no one can really remember what they did two weeks ago on the reformer. The only thing they take away from your class is actually improvements in strength and conditioning and confidence. So if they get stronger because they went to your class, now next time they go on a hike, their legs are stronger. They feel that, you know, they're going to be more confident. They're going to sleep better. That's what they get from the class. They don't care about all the movement variations. And another thing is that I believe movement variations can be used so much more intentionally. Um, right now, movement variations are just kind of chaotically added in without intention. But the way I see reformer workouts is in every exercise, there's a primary focus, which means there's a muscle group which is being targeted. So spring tension will determine which muscle group is being targeted straight away. And I'll give an example. Let's say you're doing a split, one foot on the platform, one foot on the carriage with your legs straight. If you have a light tension, as you slide out, the weight of your body will load your inner thighs. Yep. Now, if you add on a heavy spring, so you have a heavy and a light, same movement, now the outer thighs are working because you have to push. So spring tension will determine the muscle group that you're targeting. So if you can identify which muscle group you're targeting, understand which load you're using, is it body weight or is it spring tension, and then have a system to progress the intensity, that means you can look after everyone. Um, that's the only thing that really matters. And movement variations should be complementary to the primary focus and not just randomly added in for no purpose. Um, and the main thing there is, sorry, Rafa, I mean, I just love to rant these days, but I want to, so I want, well, I want to jump in and ask, what do you mean by complimentary? Can you give an example of that? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, so I'll break down one exercise for you. So let's just say you're doing a light lunge now. So you got one foot on the floor, one foot on the carriage against a shoulder block. Yep. Now there's, it's huge huge monumental different ways people teach this uh i see in, in america and australia everyone seems to have a little bit of a different spin on it from all the different ways that i've seen what i can basically say to everyone is hey if you're on a light spring and we're using body weight as a load then what we need to do is take the weight of your upper body and put it onto your front leg because that's how we're going to actually challenge the glute on the front leg now, if you put your body weight on the carriage and slide back, move your hips back, you take the weight off the front foot and it doesn't actually, yeah. So if you're doing it, it's more like a deadlift, but on a single leg. It's more like a hip hinge. Like a tippy bird or, yeah. Yeah. So the objective of that exercise is to load the front leg with the weight of the body. So you want to make the glute support your body weight. So in that exercise, what we're saying is, hey, everyone, target muscle group is the glute. Body weight's the load. Now, the more time under tension you spend, the harder this will be, the faster you fatigue. 
So every time you bend your front knee and lean forward, you're working your target muscle group, which is the primary focus. Every time you stand up, you redistribute your body weight more evenly through the leg, so there isn't really a focus. So you could say there's a work period, that's the bottom, and there's a rest period at the top. Now all you need to do is only add on movement variations at the bottom because the time it takes you to do a movement variation, anything with the arms or the legs, makes you spend more time at the bottom. Mm-hmm. So if you go down and then do a biceps curl or whatever at the bottom, yep, that's you're just increasing the work in the glute, mostly. Well, what's happening is you're reducing the rest time. So let's just say you started off, you could say standing and leaning is about a 50-50 work-to-rest ratio. And then let's just say at the bottom, next time you go down, you stop and you add in one scooter and then you stand up. Now, remember, we're using the weight of the body to load the front leg. So the more time you spend leaning forward, you're working right now. Every time you stand up, it's a break. So if you only intentionally added movement variations at the bottom, now you fatigue faster if you take these options. And then all you do is make sure that when you finish the exercise, you just stay at the bottom so that everyone gets like 100% time and attention to finish. So if you weren't doing it intentionally, what would happen is imagine if you added every movement variation at the top. So you spent more and more time at the top, like overhead press, overhead press with a heel lift, you'd never actually spend any more time loaded. So the glute would never actually fatigue more. And the reason that's important is if you're dealing with a group of people, the 50-50 work to rest ratio means that the beginners are going to get a good workout even if they just stay at that level. But if you're stronger than that, you're going to go unchallenged pretty much the whole exercise. So that 10 and seconds... And that's when clients will, will, will plateau and won't get further progress. Yeah, so I call it intentional progression. So you just say, hey, there's a primary focus of this exercise, a muscle group that we're targeting. That will be determined by the spring tension and the body position. Once we identify what the focus is, all we do is make sure the starting position is achievable for everybody. And then we scale the intensity up throughout the exercise to make sure that all the levels of ability are challenged. Right. Um, and you just and- let people get off the bus at whatever stop, right? So for those beginners who the 50-50 work rest ratio is, is enough for them, you're like, okay, you just keep doing that version. Yeah. And then for the more advanced people, you're like, okay, at the bottom, I want you to do a scooter. Yeah. So you turn it to like, you go about 50-50 and then 75-25, 75 work, 25 rest. And then if you put them in just the scooter, you could say that's 100% work and no rest to the end. So that way you can look after everyone. Now, if you don't have an intentional progression of um, load, basic your time and attention on the target muscle group, then all the stronger people go unchallenged and they're not really going to get a benefit out of it, just like what you just said then before. But the other problem is if you start too hard, let's just imagine if you started on 100%, if we just did the scooter without anything else, then all of a sudden it turns into survivor and then people fatigue at different speeds yeah, I've I've done that. I've been that teacher and just watching people wilt and fall over, and <laughs> sit down, <laughs> stand up. Yeah. So like that's a problem though, because if you've got people fatiguing at different speeds, that means we're not controlling the class. So we might have to teach a whole bunch of extra exercises because everyone fatigued too quick. Um so it's about looking after the, all the ability levels with like a plan. So that's that's pretty much the strategy there is to make sure that Uh, We don't make it too hard too early, um, but we intentionally scale up the intensity throughout there. So when we're talking about complementary, what I'm saying is that the actual extra movement patterns, we're not just randomly adding them in at any time in any body position. We're actually putting them in because they take extra time to do. So let's do them in a certain body position that aligns with the focus of the exercise. Um, And that's something that no one really talks about or thinks about that I've seen because um, that'll help you control the intensity so much easier. Um, it also means that everyone's going to load people the same way so that, that if you go to different classes on the schedule, you're going to get a result from everyone rather than just going, you're needing to find a favorite instructor. Mm. Hey, I want to, I want to backtrack to something you, you said before, um, which is, you know, talking about your journey and how you basically started out, you want, you wanted to have full classes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, then you, you, you kind of left, left Tasmania and, and went around Australia and then basically you kind of kept, just kept going, right? So once you, once you, once you started going, you, you kept going. And so it sounds to me like you you started with a pretty kind of simple goal, which was just to fill your classes, 
but that the, your goal actually changed. Like your goal grew, your vision grew. Right at some point, you're like, oh, hold on, there's there's more. You know, there's what's there's a bigger mountain I could climb. So yeah, tell me about tell me about that evolution of your of your dream of your goal. I feel like it's the same as a progressive overload strategy. It's like uh, what happened was when I first started teaching, I was nervous all the time. So I'd be nervous in the own studio that I started in, you know. And if you're at a certain level of stress, you kind of lose control of your own functions. You know, you might forget things, you might stutter, you might be like, you know, your might, heart might be racing. So I was like, okay, I'm uncomfortable right now. So that's good because that means that this is outside my comfort zone. So if I keep on pursuing what's on the edge of my comfort zone, eventually I'll be comfortable everywhere. So at the start, that was my guide. So I, I was uncomfortable in the studio. So then I started going to other studios, coming back, and I knew, I just knew that I had knowledge that was valuable. So before I even started to teach the new things that I learned, I felt really good about it. I was like, this is going to be awesome today because I know this works. I've seen everyone else do it. I know it's great. And then all of a sudden, I was really comfortable in my studio. And I was like, okay, I'm going to get outside this comfort zone again. Now I need to teach in other people's studios. So the pro the challenge is if you go and teach in someone else's studio, all the clients have an expectation based on who has been their teacher. So you could go there and you could do the best that you know, but that could be nowhere near as good as what they are. So the thing is like... Um, you could be like the biggest fish in your pond. You go to a different studio and everyone's like, oh, yeah, that was all right. Like, so I was like, damn, I, how can I, what can I do to figure out what does it take to go everywhere and have everyone really like the class? And that's when I became really kind of focused on trying to figure out what those things were, which made it work. Like the first principle idea, like what is it exactly which is working and why? So when I had all these different mentors I pretty much like sought out mentors and I probably collected about 40 of them and um but I, everyone had a different opinion everyone had different knowledge and skills everyone was taught by different training organizations and had different beliefs so eventually I just came to the idea that I'd actually need to be more like a critical thinker and make my own decisions and I base my decisions on what worked best for the clients but yeah the 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 process is kind of like natural selection in every possible sense. Like you take ideas and you try them. If they work, you keep them. If they don't work, you don't keep them. And you just keep doing it again and again. So eventually I became comfortable teaching in other people's studios, teaching people I'd never met before in their own space. And then I was like, okay, now I need to start teaching my peers because now that's uncomfortable because you're feeling the judgment because now it's almost like, amongst your peers there's a lot of people that have more experience than you or have different opinions than you so whenever you talk and explain things the amount of refinement that happens from the resistance that you get when people disagree with you is absolutely insane because then you're forced to articulate things in a different way to make it work so i started running workshops and i had people disagree with me here disagree with me there and i was like wow this is actually really tough but I feel like I'm getting sharper I feel like I'm getting like a deeper understanding because I'm forced to explain it more and more and and I can I can see in because I I teach for a living that like I not Pilates I teach Pilates teachers and explaining concepts I can see in the way that you have simplified your thinking down to really core basic things that you can explain in one simple sentence with short words that you have explained those ideas hundreds of times because you only wear it down to a nub like that. Like you only, you know, like Michelangelo said, you know, I just get the block of marble and chip away everything that's not David, you know, <laughs> and there, there's the statue, right? So I can see that you've chipped away everything that's not David. You know, you've, you've taken out all of the non-essential things from your thinking and from your, from your, from your, um, method and your explanations and i can see that is i know that's the product of explaining it many hundreds of times yeah <laughs> yeah that's the crazy thing about like talking to your peers because um you get a lot of different points of view and you got a lot of different um like if you're trying if you're running workshops one thing i always found interesting was these the 
the way people come into that space because sometimes people are coming into that space because they have to. So they're not really invent. So I'm I'm uh, I'm a, I'm an instructor at your studio, and you're like Raf. You have to come to this professional development. I've paid for it. You have to be there. And I'm like, oh fuck, that's my Saturday. I don't want to be there, you know. But I guess I've got to eye roll. Yeah. So if you're running workshops, from what I've found now, I've most run about fifty. Um, the the type of people you come across, like you just you have unbelievable. Um, experiences with people that they want to be there they don't want to be there they're interested they're not interested so you you kind of have to be at the same time you have to be like engaging and you have to be open for conversation but then you have to be able to explain everything exactly why so basically everything's like it's almost like when you, you if you've got an idea and you want to share it with a group you almost have to do the same thing they do with cars you have to like it has to be crashed into like all these different ways to prove that it's actually a good idea. So the uh, the tough process about that though is when you're getting these questions which you didn't anticipate in these moments of like maybe a bit high stress and you're like, fuck, you know, like, do you know what? That's a really good argument after think about that and you figure it out. But the process of like having people challenge your ideas continuously, eventually you get to a point where you're like, do you know what? I, th- I think I've thought about this every possible way I'm really, really confident this is exactly what I mean. But yeah, it's 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 an interesting process, and especially if you've got people with different, completely different backgrounds. Like I, I'm talking to people that haven't done any work in a gym, who haven't done any work with resistance training, have only done work, um, you know, with different methods of thinking. So they're coming from different points of view, and to try and give them um a different point of view without kind of threatening them by saying everything they they that they think might not be a hundred percent right it's kind of like yeah you have these different points of tension and you have random moments where people challenge you on things you wouldn't even expect to be challenged on but i actually say i actually love that now <laughs> it's weird because i just like i walk up into a space i don't know what to expect but i'm just excited to meet everyone and actually happened today the the ones i love the most raf are the ones we walk in there and everyone disagrees with you at the start but at the end they all agree with you that's to me is like the most satisfying it's when when people kind of maybe at the at the start of it didn't think too much of it and wrote you off a little bit but then you're able to demonstrate exactly how and why things work and they'll able to feel it in their own body and then you made sense of it logically and at, at the end they're like oh my god What's really interesting, I love that, I'm going to use this. It's like, oh, like that was a lot of hard work to try and convince you, but, you know, it feels good. <laughs> feels good. Yeah, uh, I think there's a, what I'm, you know, what I'm, what's striking me as you're talking is I think there's a, you know, like traditionally in the in the Pilates world, we have this tension between like contemporary and classical or whatever. But I think in, in my, in the orbits that I move in, I'm not really aware of that anymore. I'm not even sure if it's a thing anymore. But what I'm sensing now is there's a tension, and I don't necessarily see it as a negative tension. It's like a creative tension, I think, between uh, Pilates taught, which is, like you sort of said, it's not actually taught as as resistance training. It's kind of stretching and balance and proprioception and coordination and all of those things predominantly versus the the this this method that you're describing which is the way i like to teach pilates as well and the way i like to do pilates which is really pilates as a resistance training modality you know like you're using the reformer and your body weight as you know an alternative to a barbell or a cable machine at the gym and it's just it's a different creative way of using you know of applying resistance to the human body so you can elicit strengthening and so yeah I, i see a kind of a creative tension i don't i don't think i don't necessarily sense any hostility uh, from either side, but I see a creative tension between those kind of two different visions of you know how Pilates moves. Have you? Is that something you've observed? Would you agree with that or not? Oh, for sure. Yeah, there's definitely that. Um, one thing I do like though is to be able to not just say, "Hey, this is what I think," but this is exactly why. This is why I think this, and the reason I'll, I'll go into that kind of depth is because when I was going around doing everyone's classes and talking to the instructors, I'd always hang out with the instructors after the class and say, why did you do that? You know, like as in, why did you lay it like this? Or why did you use that spring? Or why did we do that movement? And or how, 
why did you connect those things together and, and why did you flow it like that? So I just wanted to know the intention. Well, it's like, what's the purpose? What's the purpose? Um, because if you have really solid intentions, then all of a sudden decision-making becomes a lot easier. My um, my intentions now, like they're so crystal clear. I can, You can take any single exercise that I teach. I can tell you exactly why I'm doing everything body position adjustments everything um and how i adjust it for different white different people based on their, on their body mass you know oh it, basically everything has a purpose now everything is controlled and there's a direction of progression for everything so intentions yeah it's really important i think that's a, i'm sorry to interrupt but i think that's a fundamental paradigm shift like when i learned to teach pilates we stopped pilates originally you know, and I think this is this is how I observe a lot of instructors teach when they come into our diploma, like who've who've been taught by other organisations, is basically I was taught to to teach exercises, right? So you learn a whole bunch of exercises and you teach the exercises, and you don't know why the fuck you're teaching this exercise. It's just like, well, you're teaching it because that's what you do in Pilates class, right? You teach this exercise, and if 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 someone asked me like, well, why are you doing that? I'd be like, I don't fucking know. It's like because I don't know. Like, what else? What else would I do? <laughs> you know, but. Um, you know, when, when you talk, and this is the way I think in, in, as well, like I've just written a book called How to Make $100,000 a Year Teaching Pilates, and the fundamental premise there is you have to start by what result are you going to provide to your client? You know, it's all about providing results to a client, and if you can find a result that's valuable enough to people, they'll pay you $100,000 a year for it. Um, and, but it's all about results. And so the, uh, so it's not about just like, quote, teaching a Pilates class. It's about like, what are people achieving by doing that Pilates class? And so once, once you, once you define the goal, it, it becomes really easy to work back from there and go, okay, well, if the goal was to get stronger, say like, well, what would we do in Pilates class that would achieve that goal? Right. Which exercises would I teach and what intensity would we use? And, you know, all of those things that we've talked about become like, oh, well, those are kind of obvious decisions now about, you know, which way to go and, and, and all of that. And so, but I think that that's a fundamental paradigm shift that the way I was taught was there, I didn't really have a goal with the, there was no result, there was no outcome that we were driving towards. It was just like filling up the 50 minutes with stuff, you know, <laughs> and you, you know, and you had these rules about it. You have to do forward bends and backward bends and, and side bends and all of that stuff. But it wasn't like, there was, you know, I was taught like you have to bend the spine in all directions, but I never taught you have to load the spine to near fatigue in all directions, right? Which that would be goal oriented, right? But it was just like, okay, we've done mermaids. Okay, great. Tick. You know, we did did side bending, you know. It was like, well, yeah, kind of you did side bending. That's true. But did you actually load the spine? You know, did you load the oblique muscles? Did you load the lats? Did you load the quadratus lumborum? Yeah, probably not, not that much in mermaids. Um, yeah, so I think that's a fundamental paradigm shift moving from, you know, just kind of, and, and look, you know, if you're out there and you've got a different view, I'd love to hear from you. Hit me up on Instagram, details in the in the show notes. But the way I was taught, it was, wasn't very goal-oriented and I think oriented. And I think th- what, you're, what you're doing, the way you're uh, focusing on this is a fundamentally, it really comes from fitness in my view. Would, ah. would you agree with that? Definitely. Yeah. Yes, that like I agree. Like analogy, I like to say to people is, if you have a destination pre-selected, when you have to make a decision on which way to go, it's already it's easy to do because you know where you're going. But if there is a destination pre-selected, then any direction is fine at any speed, and that's what happens when people teach classes. If there isn't something you're aiming at, if you're not trying to objectively make someone stronger, then it doesn't matter what variation you do, with what tension you do, what layer you do. Everything is just kind of more, almost meaningless because there's no like frame to work in, there's no nothing to go for. But if you say, hey, everyone, the purpose we're here is to get stronger, so that we're going from comfort to discomfort, you know, we're going to get mechanical tension on the muscle fibers, we're going to use body weight as load, we're going to use spring tension as load, I'm going to make sure that everyone gets this experience today. That is something you can measure. If you can measure it, you can improve it. So um, now we've got milestones of accomplishment, we can measure performance, now there's things we're aiming at. Now, if you're saying we're getting stronger, if the clients are getting stronger, that's basically means it's working. So if you get that from a reformer class, there's no need to go anywhere else, you know, like, and that's what I find is the most exciting is when the clients come back to you after four weeks, six weeks, they're like, oh my God, I haven't felt this good in ages. I can do this. I can do this. 
It's because they went to your class and that's the outcome. To me, there's nothing better than that. That's the ultimate feedback, you know, when the clients are telling you how much their body's improved, their confidence, their sleep, everything's better. It's because we put them through enough adversity, they adapted to it, and now they're better. So, um, yeah, I'm all about it. <laughs> so, all right, so we've got kind of two parallel conversations going on here. One's about uh, teaching and goal orientation and mechanical tension and loading. Uh, and the other one is about your sto- your journey and your story and uh, how, you're, how you've evolved. And so I want to go back and flip back to that conversation and ask, all right, so what are your, so, you know, you started out with, I would, as with very humble goals, you just wanted to learn to be a better instructor and fill your classes. And I'm pretty sure your goals have expanded quite a bit since then. And you've now got, I I don't know exactly what your current goal is. That's what I want to ask you, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be pretty big and hairy and audacious. So, yeah. So what, what's your current vision? Where are you heading towards now? What's the next challenge for you? Well, there was only, um, probably July last year, August last year. My big goal was to do this on an international level. So now I am. Um, yeah. So, so that's great. Um, for us- and I know that human nature dictates that as soon as you do a thing, you're like, okay, what's next? <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Like, my, to be honest with you, like one of the most fascinating things about traveling around and going to studios. I don't know if there's a Guinness Book of World Records for how many studios anyone's ever been to or taught at, but I reckon I'm going for that. Like that seems to be like the pure volume that I'm seeing right now is just wild. I've probably been to over 150 studios in my lifetime so far. Um, But what I'm seeing is I'm seeing so many ways to create this experience. You know, like one of the things I I love when the people have like – um different ideas and they and they bring them to life in the studio what's that studio feel like you know and so I could definitely see myself in the future having my own studio and then just putting a hundred of them everywhere um in America and Australia and what I also want to do with that is also I've got the Reformer Academy right now which is teaching people how to control intensity how to progressive overload it's pretty much designed for studios because if everybody in, on your team is loading people the same way, that means you're all aiming at the same target and you're going to get good results. I want to turn that into a certified course to enable people to anyone who does fitness to look at the reformer and go, oh, I understand how this works. Easy. So it's just, refor- it's just resistance training. So you've got exercises with body weight as load. Any exercise in which you have less spring tension making it harder, body weight is a load. Yep, okay. And then you've got exercise where more resistance is harder. Okay, spring tension is a load. Yep. So you can pretty much get anyone, teach them exactly how it works and simplify the entire process with the bigger goal of kind of blowing it up so it becomes like a super mainstream. So instead of it being like a little micro niche and not many people having ever done it, I want everyone to see the benefit of it. So everyone can go, oh yeah, reformer. Yeah, that's just like using a barbell. You know what I mean? Like it's just like so easy to understand, so normal. Um, and then to help that at the moment is just I want to try and accelerate the understanding, of, like the simple understanding of it. I want as many people to understand as possible so all the new studios opening up, at least right now in America, can be just have a real good base, like a good training base. It's pretty much like I'm giving everyone an academy process that they can just use because it's so easy to replicate it's such a simple process that as soon as you get a new person, you can just teach them the same stuff and they'll be able to do the same thing. Um, so I don't know. There's probably a couple of different directions there. There's like a studio direction. There's like a certificate direction. But then there's also like a bigger vision. The bigger vision being that everyone can see the benefit of using it and everyone's kind of using it in the future. And um, Yeah. I don't know. I, yeah. So at the moment, doing the whole international thing, I like that idea because I thought it was the most exciting. I tend to make my decisions based on what's exciting. Um, and it was such a challenging thing to figure out, Raf. I remember I had such so many conversations with so many people over age just trying to figure out how do I do it, as in how do I price it, you know, like how will that work, particularly in America. And then it got to the point where I just was like, I'm just going to try um, and I think, yeah, it's been crazy. And what, and what have you learned about pricing? Well, 
my mission with this tour was to basically go for volume. So I wanted to see as many people as I could and I wanted to simplify the process of the pricing. So I basically said, hey, everyone, this is my offering. This is my price. Uh, basic price per hour, I recommend three hours. And then people come back to me and go, okay, yep, we want that. But we also want you to teach this class and this class. And be like, okay, well, that's my service. It's just an hourly rate. Um, and I, what I did was I, I wanted it to be win-win. So if anyone wants to sell tickets to this event that we're creating, you get to set the price and you get to keep all the revenues generated. So a lot of people can offset the costs of me coming. So that just blew the gates wide open because everyone's like, oh, well, do you know what? We can definitely afford this now. So the cool thing is I've got about 40 different people promoting me at the same time because they want to get people to come to these events that I'm going to. So it's just like it's kind of exponential in its like potential. Um, and I definitely see myself every time I'm coming back to do a tour, I'll probably structure it differently, slightly different pricing. Um, but that's just inevitable. You know, if you can provide more value, then it's worth it. So the main thing is I wanted to 100% offset all my costs, but at the same time to actually make money and to get paid up front directly is what you need to do. Because if you want to start running workshops, you can't be paid after because you have so many, so many costs up front. You know, if anyone's ever been on a holiday for a week and you decide to rent a car and stay in a hotel every night, it adds up. I've been doing that for like 10 months. Gets expensive. So you want to get all the money up front and so you can start to like book things in. You know what I mean? So if anyone is interested uh, in actually kind of breaking down the transition of becoming a, a training person and kind of running around different countries doing that, I definitely can help you out with some strategies to help you do it. But the main thing is I think that you need to have some kind of insight which people would see is solving a problem. The problem I can solve is I can sell out classes and I can make sure everyone on the studio, on your team, can strengthen everyone so you, the clients don't have to pick between their favorite instructors. I can teach all the instructors to teach like that. So that all of my, that's two problems I can solve for, for studio owners straight away that they're like, yeah, we want Nathan to come in because that's what we don't know how to do yet. And like, um, I can teach them in person or I can give them the academy. Um, yeah, so isn't isn't it isn't it so weird that with all this Pilates certification that that we that's in you know that's in the world at the moment that most people don't actually learn how to make people stronger or how to pack out their classes. It's like those are like two of the most fundamental things that you need to know, in my view, to be a successful Pilates instructor. It's like it's probably like thing number one and thing number two <laughs> that you need to know. It's so weird that that people don't learn that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it is wild. And then, yeah, basically, um, as a side note, um, the benefits of doing as many different classes as you can in different studios as you can, what I'd say, Raf, is the way I see the landscape, if you're going to look at it from above, you'd say if there's a studio owner and they're in one or two studios, what happens is all those instructors train with each other all the time, so they all know each other's moves. They're like a little collective tribe that has the same knowledge. And then you go to a different studio owner, they've got different instructors, they all train together, they all know the same moves. So what I was doing was I was going between every single different type of group, I was learning everybody's moves. I was writing them all down, cataloging them, figuring out where they fit in the effectiveness kind of priority list. So that I've got like this massive database of like exercises that don't exist in manuals anywhere. So when I'm selecting exercises, I can go, do you know what? I've seen this taught about 10 different ways. This is exactly why I chose to do it like this. So um, what tends to happen is these these instructors come through, they learn so much, and at some point, if they don't open up a studio, they just leave, and all the knowledge they have, it just goes with them, and I just didn't want to see that happen anymore. So that's why I was going around to everybody, writing it all down, so that I've got the collective knowledge of like 10 years plus of some of the best instructors in Australia. I've just got it all in one spot. So that's like another point of value that I wanted to give people is, you know, that it just doesn't go to waste because what happens is in every studio, there's a couple of instructors that are like the high performers. Everyone wants to go to their classes. Everyone loves what they do. When they leave, they take all that with them. And then it takes a little bit of time again for a new person to come through. And then they become like that figure in that leader within the studio space. So I just wanted to go visit all of them learn what they all do, put it all in one spot. 
so I've got all the all that kind of content together. So that's yeah, I think that's pretty valuable too. Um, and it comes down and like and like you said, and I think we you know we pretty much talked about this the f- the first or second time that we uh, you were on the podcast, but it's basically like you said, knowing their name, you know, making them feel welcome and getting them results. That's if you if you look at it from this perspective, what do people really care about? Like people don't remember what exercises you taught last week. They remember how they felt doing the class and they remember if they felt challenged. Well, what are, as instructors, we tend to feel like we have to be so different all the time. Or we think that clients want different, different, different. The clients only get bored if they go unchallenged. If they're not challenged enough physically, then they get bored of the repetition of doing the same movements. And we think, oh, we just need to give them different movements. No, we don't. We can keep the same movements. We just need to load them more and they're not bored anymore. Right. People are bored by doing the same movements when they're not progressing. Like feeling stronger is exciting. It's exciting to feel stronger. Um, and that you reminded me of that Maya Angelou quote, which says, uh, people will forget what you said. They'll forget what you did, but we'll never forget how you made them feel. Uh, but we could just sort of twist that a little bit. And basically you did it, which is like people will forget which exercises you taught, <laughs> but they'll never forget how they felt after the, after that session. So yeah, I think that's that's the thing. It's like we don't need to come up with a bazillion new variations on these exercises. It's like people will be happy. People will be excited by progress. People are excited by progress. That's right. Anything else you want to chat about? Yeah, so um, I do feel like the the landscape is definitely changing a lot. I feel like people are starting to be a bit more curious about what everyone else is doing as in you know at the moment if you look at stu- at studios you see a lot of studios they might have like classes with different names like they might have like a sculpt class or a tone class or a cardio class so people are looking at that other cl- other studios have like a leveled system where they have like basically the same class but they've got different levels of intensity and people are looking at that and seeing what's working so there's a lot at the moment. There's a lot of people that have come through different educational programs are starting their own um, studios and people are really like starting now in any possible way. Some people are starting off with one reformer in their garage and now they've got two, now they've got three, now they're opening up a studio space. I just see that it's like people are becoming really ambitious and there's a lot of people making like great progress at their own pace so there's going to be a lot of studios in australia there already is but yeah i can see a big potential for more but in do you sorry you said australia did you mean the us i mean in australia because like from the conversations i've been having other people um there's a lot of these people that are kind of starting off i think a lot of them are doing your your courses you know they're getting one or two reformers in the garage. They're kind of they're growing out. They're getting bigger, but these is happening in more and more and more like crazy isolated locations. So now, like you know, you got people out in the middle of Western Australia. You know, you got people in um, rural parts of Adelaide starting studios in small towns. Like it's really exciting to see all these things starting to grow. Um, but yeah, from what I've seen. If you want to look at what's purely the most successful model that's easiest to replicate, the most successful model is get as many reformers as you can, teach a leveled system. That thing just seems to be the easiest, the the easiest, the most effective, the most profitable. Um, And all you need is all the instructors to load people the same way um, and you focus on progressing the client's ability. That's it. That's it. That thing will just fly. And... When I look to open up my own studio soon enough, it's going to be like that for sure. Um, so it just works so well. It's uh, it's bulletproof. It's and that's exactly the same thing that um, you know. That's what I that's what I preach is every reform is worth fifty grand a year if you can fill it, you know, thirty times a week. And so it's like the more the better. Um, and the math works out that if you have, have a minimum of 10 reformers, but just like basically 12, 15, 18, 20, like as many as you can get in the room, uh, and then uh, teach nice, simple exercises that load people up and get them stronger. Bam. Yep. Um, there's definitely one thing that you did, Raph, though, that helped me out a lot because before I started doing the workshops in Australia, 
Um, we had a conversation and I asked you about how to create a workshop and you said, what you need to do, you need to create six modules. You need to go tell people, this is what you're going to learn. You teach them that and then you say, this is what you learn. So you're pretty much just, yeah, and you want to break it down into the six things which are the most important that you think that they need to know and then kind of go from there. So that was the process I started with. I started to first off write down the things I thought were really important which but people weren't necessarily learning. So it wasn't that long ago that I had never taught a workshop before that was my own. I remember that. I, I remember that phone conversation. I was in in this room actually. I remember we were talking on the phone and um, I remember thinking like, gee, you don't know anything about this. Like this is, you're, you're brand new. You're a blank page. But now look at you. Like, you you know, you've done it hundreds of times now. And uh, yeah, so I'm glad, well, I'm glad that model was useful for you. And um, it seems, it's pretty simple. Like it's the same with, uh, like you just described in Teaching Reformer, like the the things that really get the biggest results are often the kind of super simple, not sexy, not fancy things, just like, you know, connect with people, work them, you know, load them <laughs> until they get results. It's like, that's that's all you do. And it's the same with teaching. It's like tell people, you know, figure out, okay, what are the, the, the handful of things that you that it's most important for people to know to be able to do this skill, to be able to succeed in, at, at getting their result? And then it's like, okay, just tell them, okay, we're going to learn this, Okay, now learn it. Okay, we learned that. Okay, great. Next. Yeah, it's like it is pretty simple. Yeah. Um, yeah, so for people out there that want to do that, that, want to create their own educational resources, I think you have to you have to kind of immerse yourself. You have to try and become a content expert. The other way to do that is to think about it, to talk about it, to write about it so much that you just kind of see it from all different points of view. You've tested your ideas out with different people. Um and you have to put your ideas out there, like you say, in the public realms for them to be challenged, right? Because uh, that's how you that's how you make them better ideas. Yep. Um, and then if the, if the ideas do have great results, then it's only a matter of time. Um, and that thing I was trying to say to you before about the progressive overload idea, I think it's just a great idea generally in life if you want to get better at anything. So my progressive overload was could I start to do things at a higher level and what was a high level to me was things that stressed me more. So, like, you know, that progression from teaching in a studio, teaching other people's studios, teaching your peers, teaching your peers interstate, uh, running a workshop, doing it nationally, doing it internationally. Like, every one of those steps at one point in time was really outside of my comfort zone. Um, so, as a personal guide for anyone out there listening now, whatever's outside your comfort zone right now, the only reason it's outside of your comfort zone is because right now there's a gap in skill or knowledge. That's why you feel like that. So if you go at that thing and try and figure it out, as soon as you understand it, you won't feel that way. You'll be that'll be within the comfort zone now for you. So use that as a guidance system. Whatever's uncomfortable means that's the next thing you need to know. And um, reject avoidance as a strategy because avoidance just means you're going to stay in the same place without actually growing or learning. So yeah, go directly at the things. Reject avoidance. Um, get uncomfortable. And yeah, immersion. Like a lot of times when I'd go on the weekend to do studios, I'd do like three classes in a row physically. I'd just be wrecked, you know. Or I'd go and sit in and watch someone teach for three, four hours and just write down. So it's like complete immersion. I'd just be the whole weekend, I'd just be doing that. And if you do it enough, you start to see patterns. So pattern recognition is one of the first things I think you learn when you're an instructor. You start to say, oh, okay, I see there's a, there's a bit of a system that seems to be there using here. And if you understand the patterns enough, then you can start to create your own. Um, so if you can create your own patterns and their work, then you kind of go, okay, well, maybe there's something deeper to this. Maybe there's like a theory behind this. Maybe there's some, like a principle here. And if you can boil everything down to like what really matters and be able to control how you load people, there's nothing, no one you can't help. Because if you look at like you got physical therapy or physiotherapy and then all they're doing is great at exercise to help recover from injury, but it's just a continuum of it, of load. And all you do is it just becomes more load or more dynamic, and then all of a sudden you've got dynamic reformer classes. But they're basically the same movements, just with more load or being more dynamic. So that's why I think if you just focus on what is it which links everything together, it's resistance training. What do you actually need to build muscle? Load. So if you can control the load, you can help everyone. You know, like it's that, and now all of a sudden, all the information 
doesn't have to be identified with a certain group because all the information is relevant. It's like I like I look at all different types of movement patterns. I just pick the things that I like that I think will work the best. I don't really identify with a mentor or with a training organization. I look at everything and go, okay, what's going to be useful? Why? Make my own decisions. Um, so yeah, I promote critical thinking. I want people to challenge what they know because usually people just say and do things that they were taught without ever asking why. And if you do ask them why they, if they can't give you an answer, then that's a bit of a gray area. You know, it's good to explore that, you know, and then come up with your own decisions and start to let things go that don't work. And the, the processes will always change and you'll always be improving and becoming a better instructor than you were before if you're always challenging what you know. But yeah, that's another thing I found massive a massive challenge, Raph, is people tend to really identify so strongly to the person who taught them what they know and the, where that came from. I'm an XYZ brand of training instructor. Yeah, and if what happens is they just ignore or... Um, just don't absorb any other information and they just stay right there. They stay right there. And it doesn't, if they don't move forward with that kind of mindset, you know, like the reality is that it's just resistance training. So there's going to be different ways of doing it. Um, there isn't really a specific order to do the exercises which make it better. It's kind of like um, there's so many ways to do the same thing. Well, I think that that comes back to something that we talked a lot about very early on in this podcast, which is the uh, kind of basically the magical thinking that there's some kind of special, you know, unicorn rainbow magic about Pilates that is bigger than just stretching and strengthening, you know, it's like, no, it's just strength, stretching and strengthening, you know, <laughs> that's all, that's all it is. And, and there's not, you know, so there's nothing different or better about Pilates apart from the fact that it's really fucking fun <laughs> And, you know, like, but it's just, it's just resistance training. It's just, resi it's no better or worse than using a barbell or a dumbbell or a cable machine or a rowing machine or whatever. It's like, it's a tool. It's a tool to apply load to the body. And it's a really cool tool um, that gives us lots of versatility, lots of options, lots of fun, endless variations. Uh, but it, there's, there's, it's nothing other than resistance training. You know, when you boil it right down to it, that's, that's what it is. It's a cable machine with springs instead of weights. Yep. And one thing I'd love to do just for everybody right now is just to go, if you look at it, if you look at the load that we're using, so there's body weight as load, there's spring tension as load, and there's external load from dumbbells. Now, the difference between external load, as you standardly think about it, and springs is external load doesn't change its load. It's consistent. If you're looking at doing a leg press at the gym, let's say it's 185 pounds, around 90 kilograms, at the start of the movement, middle of the movement, end of the movement, and your full range of motion, it weighs the same. But if you're using spring tension, the springs will gradually stretch more. As they stretch more, they have more load. So um, that's a little bit of a difference. So um, what it means is we have so many ways to control the intensity. If I give you one example, Raph, if you're looking at body weight specifically, you can say, all right, everyone, if body weight's the load, what can we do? What we're saying is less support is harder. So one thing you could do, you could change the spring to give you less support. That will make it harder. You could change the spring stretch. Less spring stretch is less support. That'll make it harder. You could change the body By, position. For example, if you're doing, in your example, side splits before, you could actually start with your carriage foot further out on the carriage so that you stretch the spring less and get, hence get less support from the spring. That's right. Um, um, so you got change the spring, change the spring stretch. You can change the body position. So what happens is you're taking the weight of your body and you're forcing a muscle group to support you, okay? Um, if you put more of your own mass onto that muscle group, that makes it harder. Like the difference like between leaning, leaning forwards in a lunge, for example. Yeah, but you could go like the difference between doing a plank with your knees down or your knees lifted. So it's the same as putting on extra weight on a bench press it's the same idea. You're putting extra weight onto your abdominals. You have to carry that. So it's like extra load they have to experience. So you've got change of spring, change of spring stretch. You've got extra load from changing the body position. Um, and we've got time under tension as well. We can control that. 
So we can intentionally give you a work and a rest period and then take the rest away. So that's four different ways you can control the experience when using body weight as a load. Now, if you're intentional with it, that means you can make every single progression incremental and calculated. If it's incremental and calculated, it's like going up a staircase. Now, that means that you're going to build monumental trust with the clients because they're going to be able to anticipate that when you um, deliver load, it's predictable. It's going to be just a little bit harder on the on the target muscle group. And the problem that instructors run into is they don't have a system. So it's chaotic. It's unpredictable. Sometimes they give a progression, but the progression is a monumental leap in intensity, which is unachievable. Then sometimes they give a progression, but it actually switches the focus to a different muscle group. So the more you can understand the fundamental basics of resistance training and how that works with the reformer, it gives you so many ways to control intensity, which means you build a lot of trust, which means you make people stronger because... Imagine if you went to a personal trainer, Raf, and you went there six months and they never changed the weight or the reps. Would you say it's a good experience? I'd, I'd, I just can't imagine that ever happening. That's <laughs> inconceivable. <laughs> now, people go to reformer classes and never change their spring. I know. It's crazy. You know, it doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't make sense at all. Like if, you, if you're still doing footwork on whatever number of springs you were doing it on six months ago, it's like that's just a warm-up now. It's not... You know, you're not going to work, you know, you're not going to continue to get stronger unless you continue continue to increase the challenge. That's it. And then if you put every single exercise on the reformer, basically anything which uses the springs, there's only two possible pathways of progression. It's either less support is harder, meaning body weight's the load, or the exercise, the progression is more resistance is harder, meaning spring tension's the load. Now, the interesting thing is when people provide two spring options in a class, Let's just say you've got a balanced body machine. You say blue is beginner, yellow is intermediate, if you say that. Okay. Now, what you're saying is less spring tension is harder. What we're saying is the second option is always more load. Always. Even if the spring's lighter, what's happening is you've got more of your own body weight to support with less support. So you have to like deal with more of your own mass and have less support from the spring. That's why it's more load. For the second option i think that's a common mistake that i've seen a lot in classes i've attended and and watched is people give spring options so say oh, you know one spring or half spring but they won't say which is harder yeah and it's like well how do i choose between those two options if i don't know which one's harder <laughs> yeah so that's the information the clients need they need to know what they're doing what muscle group is challenging what load are we using and what uh, is the progression strategy? Because if you're saying body weight's the load, what we're saying is the slower you go, the further you go, the harder it will be. Because it's time and attention that we're using to load these muscles. But if you're saying that more resistance is harder, that means we need to generate force. We're going to have to probably move fast. So if we've got enough resistance to push against where you keep resistance to the full range of motion, hey, everybody, we need to be powerful. We need to push this thing. You know, so all of a sudden, all the cues just make logical sense. You don't really have to think about it too much. There's going to be an alignment with the, what we actually need to do to make it work. And there's always going to be a more optimal range of motion depending on what the challenge is, you know. So, yeah, everything comes into alignment and then you can even focus on things like tonality. Like if you speak slower in an exercise which requires you to move slow, it's going to make a lot of sense, you know. But if you go want them to move fast, then you need to speak with some intensity. And then the verbs you use, you know, like you want to emphasize the effort with the verb, like if it's a push or a press or if it's a drag or squeeze, if you're pulling it in, you know, like you, so you can break down everything to be so intentional that the majority of people are going to understand, understand you straight away because there's nothing that's kind of being crossed over accidentally. Like if you say push to someone on a light spring, they think they have to apply force. They're going to move fast. All of a sudden, you've got someone moving fast on a light spring. It doesn't make it harder. It just, yeah, it kind of just dilutes the focus. So yeah, intentionality is like a crazy thing which can be really powerful. But what I, yeah, what I like to see is I want to empower the instructors with all this knowledge and I feel like it just fills the gap, the gap that helps them give results to people. And if clients can consistently get results, 
instructors have a better time. They feel more fulfilled. They enjoy what they do more because they're making an impact. Well, I, I, well, when I when I when uh, I mean when instructors tell me about like what they love about their job, it's almost invariably it's the, what they say is I love that moment when the client says to me, oh, "I feel stronger," or I, "I could do this exercise I couldn't do it before," or "I I feel so much better in my body." You know, like it's the client. It's basically clients reporting their results <laughs> is what what gives instructors a kick. Hey, I just want to go back to what you said a moment ago. Uh, about understanding the, the difference between spring tension versus a weight versus body weight um, and how that springs increase tension as you stretch them, right? So an example of footwork, at the bottom of footwork, there's almost no tension, right? Whereas at the top of footwork, there's high tension, right? And so I think this is such a fundamental point that many instructors don't understand. And I, because it's not taught in most certification programs, like I never learned it. In fact, when I did my certification program, we learned to do like inner range pulses. You know, it's like bottom of the bottom of the footwork with your with your legs bent, the carriage almost on the stopper, and you're doing pulses. And it's like there's freaking zero tension on the springs in that position. It's like what the fuck do you what are, what are you doing in that position? You're not doing anything, right? You just basically you could do I could do twenty thousand of those without getting <laughs> you know tired. So what's the point? Like there is definite like if you were doing say a squat. Right or a one-legged, or like a, a a scooter or a lunge or something, definitely do bottom range pulses. That'd be an awesome, you know, option because you've got actual load in on the body part in that position. But in footwork, I think you know, to me that that the fact that I was taught in my certification program to do inner range pulses in footwork really just indicates that the people who were teaching the certification program didn't understand the fundamental principles of that we're talking about here of loading and of spring tension how spring tension works right do you see that a lot oh yeah like people are always blown away if if you take one point like we just spoke about with body weight as a load and we talk about one of the strategies which was intentionally changing the body position to stretch the spring less as a way to progress People are just like blow their minds are exploding. Like, oh my god, it's harder. How? It's like, yeah, well, if you change your body position, that means the spring stretch is less. If there's less spring stretch, there's less support. It's harder. Everyone's like, what the fuck? So, and this, so this is just like in a in a side splits, you know, putting your foot further out on the carriage, or in a lunge, putting your your front foot further forwards towards the foot bar end of the carriage on the floor, you know, somewhere. Basically, stretch the spring less less support. More, more body weight. Yeah, it basically every single exercise in which you're using it, you could do it in some form. I'll give an example. Imagine if you're holding a plank, let's say you're on your forearms on the carriage and you've got your feet on the platform. Let's say it's a full plank, maybe doing some shoulder extensions, sliding the carriage out, bring it back in. Now, the distance between, let's just say your foot bar is down, so it's horizontal. Um, now, if you step your feet from the platform to the foot bar, the distance between the platform and the foot bar is the distance the spring will stretch less. That's going to be a lot harder now to do the same exercise because there's less support. That kind of thing, you can do it with basically every single exercise. Just three or four inches makes a big difference. Huge. But then it's the exact opposite if you're going for heavy is harder. For example, if you're doing like a heavy lunge standing on the floor inside foot in the shoulder pad, if you were to hop your foot on the floor back about a foot, that's the distance more you'd stretch the spring in that range of motion now, more resistance. And like, yeah, a lot of this stuff, people kind of intuitively do it, but they can't articulate it because they've never made that connection. Like, for example, when people do like a kneeling chest press with the straps in their hands, if you were to hold your arms straight and just look at how much you're stretching the spring, a common progression for that is to lift your hips up. Now, if you lift the hips up, you stretch the spring an extra like 10... 15 centimeters that's why it's harder it's because you're stretching the spring more so you can really look at every exercise and go every way you could progress it it's all to do with tension that's it it's just tension it's either more tension or less and more tension being harder or less tension being harder depending on what the load is that's it so that's how like exact it can be and then the only thing you really need to consider is if you're using body weight as load if you've got a big range of body mass within the class that the average body mass is going to have a similar experience, but the outliers are going to have a different experience. If you've got significantly more mass, you're going to be working harder because you've got more load and um, the spring won't magically readjust itself to support you the same as everyone else. 
You know what I mean? It's just going to be like not helpful for you. But then if you're much lighter, then you might actually be pushing against it. Right. So uh, say a long stretch or a plank on a, you know, on a half spring for someone who's, you know, a hundred pounds might be pretty easy, but for someone who's 300 pounds would be like incredibly hard. Yeah. So I, I had this experience actually on this trip. So I, I got to, um, I had a, someone book in a, a private session with me when I was traveling. Uh, and this person was um, great, great person. Uh, 300 pounds. They had a, they wanted to speak to me because they wanted to know how to modify the spring tension to make sure that they got the same level, the same kind of experience as everybody else. Because at that time, they weren't getting modifications and it was just unachievable. So... If you took the exercise we spoke about much earlier today and you said, all right, let's do the standing split, one foot of the platform, one foot of the carriage. Now, what was said was that if the, at some point, if you look at tension like a range, that at some point the focus shifts from the inner thighs to the outer thighs depending on the resistance. So for someone with the average body mass doing reformer classes, the difference between the inner thighs and the outer thighs is usually the blue spring versus the red. So in pounds, the blue spring's around 30 pounds and the red's around 45 pounds. So it's the difference in that kind of tension between the inner thighs and the outer thighs. Now, for someone who weighs 300 pounds, the difference between the inner thighs and the outer thighs was a red-yellow versus a red-blue. So if we had them on a blue spring, they're looking like super advanced level, way harder than everyone else. It's just not enough support to give them a full range of motion for them to be able to do it properly. So that person needed a whole readjustment in spring tension to be able to do the same exercise as everyone else. So what I'm proposing is what's the most important thing in a class is not the spring you're on. It's actually the ability to guarantee everyone's having the same level of intensity on the same muscle group, regardless of your body. And that's why I'm saying it's just load. It doesn't have any inherent value. It doesn't make you better or worse than anyone else. You know, if you go to a gym, everyone's using different weight for everything. No one thinks, oh, that's a good thing. That's a bad thing. That's a, that's this, that's that. No one cares because it's whatever the load that you require. And if you do great work in training, the load will be adapted because you need more load to keep getting better. So that's why I want to normalize the idea and the practice of adapting spring tension all the time, adapting dumbbells all the time because people would get stronger. They need more of a challenge. If you've got more mass, you need more support. Um, it's just, it's not a big deal, you know? And I believe our greatest role as instructors is to actually be prescribing the load like a doctor prescribes medicine. We make the recommendations and we adjust it for you. Like when I'm running a class, I am I know exactly what spring everyone's on because I'm always checking and I'm watching their movement speed and their range of motion and I'll make adjustments if I think they can do more because I want them to get the best experience possible. If I don't look, anything could happen. Now it's out of my control. I don't want that to happen. Um, but another thing to say, Raf, if if just to say you've got one class, let's say you've got 12 people, you say you've got a big range of body mass. Let's say we've got some people that are 300, we've got some people around like the 100 to 200 range, and then you've got some people lighter than that. Now, everyone in the median range is going to have a similar experience. Imagine if you went to a studio and they said, hey, everybody, we're going to do this exercise. We're going to put everyone on the same spring. What's going to happen is that everyone's going to have a different experience. It's going to be purely dependent on their mass. So you're going to say about 60 to 70% of the people are going to have the experience we intended. Everyone else, ah, oh, you'll be right. You're probably going to work at advanced level and you probably might not feel that at all. So one thing I want to say to people is, hey, um, rather than just leaving it to chance and hoping they can change it themselves, they don't know how to do it. That's our job. Like we make the changes for them. We guarantee they get the experience we want. I want to be able to say, hey, everybody, if you walk through this door into this class today, I can guarantee you, you're going to work the muscle group I intend at the intensity level that's right for you, irrespective of your body. And no one's going to be left out to drive regardless of their body mass. I think that's the ultimate when it comes to getting a good experience. And another thing I want to throw in there, Raf, is that the way I see stability as in a challenge, I see stability as an element particularly in any exercise in which you're standing on one leg, and I see stability is being determined by the surface you stand on. 
So if you're standing on, a, on the floor, it's just hard and flat. You've got great stability. If you keep on going into like less stable surfaces, obviously balancing becomes harder. But if you inc inc um, increase elevation, so if you're standing off the floor, it becomes harder. But if you've got your body weight on a moving surface, which is elevated, then it's way, way harder. So I see kind of restricting challenges of stability intentionally based on the client's ability level because I don't want to give them things they can't do. Um, so that's one thing I tell people is I say, hey, there's so many ways to do this lunge. We don't have to do the one with the lowest amount of stability, particularly if there's people in here that can't balance very well. They're not going to benefit from that kind of challenge. What they need is to be in a position which they can do it for longer, do it better, build the confidence, get stronger. So right. I see, and and the, I'm I'm with you on that. And the reason I, I'm with you, I mean, I agree with what you said, but I think there's an additional thing, which is that as you decrease stability, you actually decrease the amount of of force that you can produce with those prime mover muscles. Because, say, for instance, in a lunge, like you said, the prime movers are the glutes and the quads as well. And so, uh, ad, but as you decrease stability, like if you did that lunge with your front foot on the reformer carriage for example, or your front foot on a BOSU, um, you're going to have to do a lot more stabilisation by co-contracting all of the muscles around the hip and knee. So you'll co-contract not only your glutes and quads, but you'll co-contract your adductors, your abductors, your hamstrings, you know, the hip flexors, all of those muscles around the joints will contract. And because you're contracting your hip flexors at the same time as your glutes, right, the hip flexors are actually working against the glutes, so you actually can produce less force. So when you're lunging with your foot on the carriage, you can't produce as much force and hence can't get as much mechanical tension on the glutes and hence don't get as much strengthening benefit. So there's an inverse relationship between force production and stability. You know, the, the less stability you have, the less, or well, not inverse, the the instability, I guess. The, the, less, the less stability you have, the less force you can produce, right? So if you want to get strong, you need to be on a stable surface, <laughs> most of the time to do that so i think in my view stability training is valuable but it should be a, a small part of of a class and most of the class in my view should be if you go if your goal is to strengthen should be done rel on a relatively stable situation because you can get more load definitely oh yeah so i i see the relationship between stability as being something that we can administer intentionally we can intentionally give someone less stability if that will benefit them but there's no need to give them less stability if there's no benefit. So because we can still work the same muscle group with the same movement pattern if you're standing on the floor, on the box, on the platform or the carriage, the only thing that's different is the stability you have when you do it. Why give someone with poor average balance a challenge with low stability in which they could injure themselves if they fall? It doesn't benefit them to do something high risk. They can get the same result or better if they're in a safer position they can do it for longer. So... I see it like if you learn to drive a car, you usually start off in a car park or a parking lot because it's low risk, educational, you get the reps in, you build up your, your awareness and your confidence and your competence and when you've got a better level of ability, then you start to take on challenges but we don't go straight on the highway at 80 or 110 in your first go on a car because it doesn't help you drive a car doing that kind of thing. So that's why I say don't put someone in a, on a lunge with their body weight on a moving surface on the carriage in their first class or if they're a beginner because it doesn't help them do it better. They won't do it very well. So they're going to feel um, a bit insecure. They're going to feel a bit threatened. They're going to be a bit hesitant in their movement pattern. They're going to fatigue quick. Um, and if you defeat them too many times in a class, they just want to come back. They think that it's not for them. So You need to give them wins, not losses. Yeah, so what I'm saying is to everybody, be intentional because there's so many ways to do the same thing. Stability is an element we can control, we can administer it. Be strategic with who you give stability challenges to. They're not for everyone, you know. Be safe, uh, look after everyone. Don't put people in positions which they could fall. Um, and also complexity. Complexity is also an element which is not essential to get stronger. You know, I would say I would say it's actually antithetical to getting stronger. Like the the if you look at the strongest people in the world, the things they do to get strong are incredibly simple: bench press, squats, deadlift. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So complexity and stability, the things we can administer intentionally. We don't have to keep coming up with different movement patterns because it doesn't serve a purpose. The greatest purpose is to make people actually stronger from the workout 
if your primary focus is hitting up the major muscle groups and working them to mechanical tension and all the other movement patterns are complementary, it's a great experience and they get a great outcome. But just purely trying to make movement patterns that are different for no greater purpose than that, it's not enough. It's not enough. It's not enough. I just um I get yeah, I I just feel like we need so much more intention than just random movement. Well, I think I think you know, I think people get distracted or maybe intimidated or something by by all of the kind of fancy move they see maybe on social media, you know, sitting on a box with a fit circle between your legs and your other foot in a strap and a ball in your other hand and whatever. Whereas in reality, like a lunge and a plank and a rowing movement. It's like that's all you that's all you need. <laughs> um, and and you know, every great trainer in any discipline, whether it's Pilates, you know, fitness training or, or any other thing, will affirm that the way to get uh, outstanding results is the boring, unsexy work of repeating simple, effective exercises, you know, over weeks, months and years with increasing load. Like that is how you get strong. <laughs> It's just the simple stuff done repeat, repeatedly with more load. Yeah, so that's that's the message I really want to encourage everyone to embrace because that's like the highway to like alignment within the studio because everyone can be on board with that mission. It's really, very clear if you're doing it or you're not doing it because it's subjective, you know. Um, and if anyone is interested in doing my Reformer Academy, then go to my Instagram or go to my website. Um, uh, we'll put a link in the show notes. Yeah. And what I want to do today is give a, um, a discount code to anyone that loves to listen to Raf because he's a legend. So I'm going to call it Raf25. So R-A-P-H 25. Um, so numbers 25. And that'll give you 25% off my academy if you're interested in that. Just check out nathanrossreese.com.au. Um, but I've got a question for you, Raf. So you, you spoke to me earlier about like what's next for me and my great ambitions for the future. Um, and I've always seen you as a mentor to me because you've um, done things that a lot of people haven't done before. So I find that kind of exciting and I enjoy talking to you. So my question is, what's your next biggest ambition what is the next thing you want to achieve um what kind of scale are you thinking at right now huh well thanks for asking um well so our, i've got a few very exciting goals that i'm working towards at the moment that we're working towards at breathe education like the whole company working towards uh so our goal for this year uh, 2023 is to hit 10 million dollars in revenue um and that's a pretty big jump from where we currently are so that that's like more than double <laughs> what we are so that's that's a pretty big goal uh, and we've got many kind of like initiatives that we're going to do to 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 hit that. But I think that probably the most profound shift is a found fundamental shift in our offer that we've you know been offering this certification in Pilates for people to become Pilates instructors. You know, in addition to the diploma that teaches Pilates instructors to become better Pilates instructors. But the certification we've been thinking of it as a certification to you know like become certified. But what we realize we realize is actually people don't want to become certified what they want is to to start a new career as a Pilates instructor right and the certification is just a stepping stone towards that so the the actual result they want is not certification the result they want is a new career you know they want to make a living as a Pilates, teaching Pilates doing what they love and so we've decided to actually deliver that result and so this is the whole thing with a book that I've written how to make 100k a year teaching Pilates we're actually building that how to do that how to how to you know, build your own Pilates business or get a job in a studio into the certification. And from our May intake, we're going to be able to actually guarantee people to actually make their first 5K teaching Pilates within 90 days after ending, uh, after completing the certification. So we're actually building it. Uh, it's like we're not just delivering a, a certification, we're actually delivering a career now to people so that is massively exciting to me because i you know i'm really excited by business i'm excited by entrepreneurship and i see the pilates industry is you know full of you know wonderful people who are not making the money that they could be making and 
and uh, I think we can I think we can change that. I can think we can bring the Pilates industry from its knees to its feet <laughs> financially. So uh, I'm very excited. I'm very excited about that. That's my that's that's what's firing me up at the moment. I love that. I love that. And do you have any strategies right now for people that are instructors but want to create more income than what they're making currently as being an instructor full time? Uh, well, if you're working for someone else in a studio, yeah, I mean, I've just, I've literally just written a 55,000 word book on this topic. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, which, is, which is, we're in uh, 1st of February in, on my side of the international date line right now, we're on 31st of January where you are, uh, 2023. So this book will be out, I would say probably within the next four weeks. It's completed. It's with the proofreaders and typesetters and whatever at the moment, um, uh, but basically, if you work in a studio, so number one, the easiest way to make more money is to work for yourself, right? And Nathan, you know this is true. <laughs> oh yeah, about ten times more. Right, and so the reason the reason for that is when you work for yourself, you're in control. You're in control of all the variables, right? You can set the pricing, you can set the results, you can choose which clients you work with. You, all of those things you can choose. When you work in a studio, you don't have control over what the studio charges, you don't have control over how many clients you can see in one session, like or the marketing, you know, you don't have control of these things. So if you work at a studio, the number one thing you can do to make more money is choose the right studio to work at. Choose a studio, like Nathan said, with 10 plus reformers in, or, you know, 10 plus clients in the session. But if you've got a, set, if you've got a studio that's going to make you know, enough money to pay you a lot, they're going to have to be charging like twenty three plus dollars per session, and they're going to have to have a minimum, absolute minimum of ten people in the room, preferably fifteen or twenty. Um, and because you should expect to, you know, roughly kind of sorta of capture about twenty five percent of the the revenue from that session, right? And so, what, the more people in the room, the more bums on, the more reformers, the more you can capture. So, right? so if you're working in a studio that only has six reformers in it, you're not going to earn good money there because the, in, literally the studio owner cannot afford it. You're probably already making more than a studio owner. So go find a studio with 12, 15, 20 reformers in it, go work there and ask for a pay for performance deal where it's like, I fill the class, I get 25%. That's how to make more money. <laughs> yep. Well, I've got some strategies too. Um, what are they? Love to hear them. Yeah, so one of the things that my goal at the start of, was it 2022? Uh, usually, Raph, what happens to me, at the start of every new year, I tend to be pissed off for a couple of days. And I'm, I was told trying, this is the first year that didn't happen. And I think the reason is is because whenever you have the start of a new year, it's always like you're kind of reminded of the whole thing about New Year's resolution and where am I in track with my goals and da 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 da. And I've always felt like my massive goal was to do international workshops and stuff. And it always felt like I was kind of getting there, but it wasn't there. But this year, obviously, I'm here, so I feel good. But at the start of last year, I was like, I want to 10x my income this year. This year, I need to take the skills and the knowledge I've learned, I need to find a way to package it. And I need to separate my time from money because I'm doing 40 hours a week of instructing. I'm not getting paid anymore. I've hit my limit. I can't do this at this level and I can't make any more money. So I have to change my strategy. So if anyone, I recommend set up a Shopify account, link it to your Instagram and start creating products you can sell to separate your time from money. There's got to be things that you become an expert at particularly if it's reformer stuff, you might have some inspiration, you might have some strategies, classes, you might have anything in particular, what it, is, what it is, put it in a video format and sell it on Shopify as a product because all of a sudden you can, if you can separate your time for money, now you're making more money, you know, and then if you become a content expert in it, then it's going to work. Like the difference between doing this, Raf, if I hadn't done that, I'd still be there, still teaching 40 hours a week. I like the amount of that was so low energy because I was at my limit physically and mentally. It's un it's unachievable to do that for a certain period of time. You have to, guy. If you want to change it, you have to change it. Um, you can't just do the same thing you've always done. If you want to make more money, you have to find a different way. So, I'm very grateful for every single thing that happened, which led me to becoming 
to going down this path. And to be honest with you, a lot of them are really uncomfortable. Uh, there's a lot of conflict with different people. Whenever you're growing, you know, you're going to see all different sides of different people. And whatever happened, I'm very grateful that it happened the way it did because now it's put me in a place which is much better. So if you're uh, in any way relatively disagreeable and you believe in your own ideas, start selling them online. So Couldn't agree more. Um, you know, and I, I 100% agree that the the if you want to make uh, if you want to make as much money as possible, the only way to do it is start your own business. Um, but you can make great money teaching in a studio if you choose the right studio. Um, uh, but you'll always make more working for yourself um, because you've got the control over all of the variables. You can charge you know whatever you want. You can make whatever product you want. You can serve whichever customers you want. Solve whichever problem you want to solve etc so you can advertise more or less you know you, you've got control of all those variables whereas when you work in a studio you you don't have control of any of that plus you're splitting the revenue with the studio owner um so yeah definitely uh with you and i agree that it's um i think if you want to if you want to if you want to put yourself out there and sell products like education products uh, yeah, probably you do have to be a little bit disagreeable. And I know what you mean by that, Nathan, is like that you don't, not a people pleaser, basically. Um, and not like that you're an asshole, but that's like, it's like you, you, you're, you're, you can, you can, you know, it's can water off a duck's back to you when, if somebody, you know, hates on you. Uh, because when you put yourself out there in public, you're going to get haters. That's what happens. Um, but, and you're going to get people that are threatened by you, maybe uh, in organizations that you used to work for. <laughs> And I know that's happened to both of us. Um, and it's, but that's like, you have, you can't, you can't get stressed by it. It's just, uh, that's, that just is more of a reflection of them and, uh, is not really, you know, you just have to be able to, to, to shrug that off and, and keep going. And if, if that's not you, uh, if you're very agreeable, um, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I think the best, I think if you are very agreeable and you don't want to put yourself out there and the thought of that absolutely fills you with terror and revulsion, <laughs> then, then I would start a business from home. Uh, and, uh, I would wait till the end of uh, this month when my book comes out and uh, buy it for $5 and learn how to start a business from home and make a hundred K in your lounge room or your garage or whatever, uh, or teaching online, um, teaching four clients at once, um, in a boutique Pilates setting. But you're still going to have to put yourself out there because you're going to have to advertise. You're going to have to charge, tell you know, look at people with a straight face and tell them it's six hundred bucks, um, and all of those things. <laughs> so you still have to, you still have to you know have a fair deal of gumption. Um, but like you said before, Nathan, I think that's good discomfort. Um, and I I agree with what you said earlier that the way to overcome fear and lack of confidence is just to do the thing. You know, the confidence comes after you do the thing not before um so the confidence comes from reps so yeah so it's like if the thing that you fear that's the thing you should do and the way to get over your fear is to just do the freaking thing yep yep um this brought me for some reason i've been brought back to one of the first things you asked about like uh what's the difference what are you seeing differently in america and and stuff one thing i notice is that for some reason, everyone wants to cue, almost like they're singing. Um, and I'll clarify what I mean by that. It's just like cue, 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 cue. Just like so much, so much, so much, so much. But to be honest with you, I've seen that in Australia as well. It seems to be like a, a kind of a thing. So one thing I really like to try and challenge people to do is be selective with the cues. Actually, just like be present in the room, see what people are doing, and only give them information that's relevant and what they need. Um, so, yeah, that's like less is more in every possible sense. And um, yeah, apart from that, um, the people are generally surprised that they can use so much load on a reformer. Like to give an example, like I'm giving, I'm teaching people to do sideline legs in a red, blue, yellow, foot in strap. What's that like? Two and a half, something like that. So that's like about 95 pounds um, at full spring stretch. So that's, I'm a bit more used to pounds and kilograms now. I've been here too long. No, that's cool. Red, blue, yellow. But yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, so that's like heavy, medium, and a light. So, so like that. Um, so that's 
Like that's much more than standardly used. But if you look at the way the legs are built, quads, glutes were built to be loaded. It's easy. And then, you know, if you can do three springs in a in sideline position, that means you can do all the springs with both feet in the straps doing a frog press. So all of a sudden people are like, I can't believe I can do that. They never thought they can do it. But if you're specific with the body position and the speed of movement, all of a sudden there's a lot more options than have previously been considered. But the thing is that if you're doing such heavy load, you're going to get strong pretty fast. So, And you're going to run out of springs. <laughs> yeah. Well, honestly, they... If I tell you what, Raf, if I do open the studio up, one thing I want to do, I want to over-engineer the shit out of the risers at the back. So they're not like fishing rods. They're going to be rock solid. And I'm going to bolt them to the floor. Yes, so they don't slide across. Because when you're doing scooters on three springs or something, the reformers go, or jump board or whatever, the reformers, you know, wiggle across the floor. We actually had um, little, at, at my studio, we had little wooden blocks that we bolted to the floor in an L shape around each of the feet of the reformer to stop them moving. Yeah. So rather than bolting the reformers to the floor, that's much better because if you bolt the reformers to the floor, then when you need to like do maintenance on them, like change the straps or whatever, it's like a real pain up the backside to get them off the floor. So, and also the cleaners can't get under them, so they get dust and stuff. So it's better to put these just to, just like two little bits of wood, you know, in an L shape, just on the outsides of each, of each leg at each corner of the of the reformer and that way they can't slide across the room in any direction but you can easily lift them up off the floor and get it the you know if you need to replace a spring or the rope or, or whatever underneath okay yeah took us like three years to figure that out we tried bolting them to the floor we tried all kinds of shit and it's like Did you? <laughs> first first we tried like just you know torn up yoga mats underneath underneath each of the legs you know to finish a bit of grip and it's like no that didn't work and then we tried um bolting them and oh yeah you know, we had to unpull the rubber feet off them and put the bolts from the rubber feet into the floor and it, then it was like then we came to like oh we need to do maintenance on these it's like oh fuck you know <laughs> this guy takes like three hours to unbolt all the reformers off the floor <laughs> so yeah don't bolt them to the floor mate okay <laughs> yeah no that makes a lot of sense you can just lift them in lift them out that'll be good yeah um all right, this has been awesome, Nathan. So great to talk with you. There's so much more we could talk about. Maybe we'll do another one soon. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, well, just to let you know what's going on, um, I'm almost finished now in America. So I've got, yeah, about 10 to go. And then I've got Canada. And then I'm going to Ireland, Scotland, England, Italy. And then that's as far as I've got booked so far. So that's all the way through to, to April. Um, and... I sometimes I just wake up and think, what the hell? Because I'm in a different place, I'm in a different studio, I'm meeting different people, and everywhere I go, people are so very friendly. When I'm teaching in different countries, sometimes I have a translator. That is so cool. You know what? You have to be really minimal with the cues if you want to do that because they can't translate everything you say, so you have to do less is more. So like this is the kind of, I just want to encourage everyone, if you do have a dream, yeah, just dive into that rabbit hole and just go for it because it's only a matter of time before you get the skills and knowledge to make it happen. And the fact that now I can just get up and do whatever I want every day, I don't have to be anywhere at any time, I can make money online um, and then I can go meet people and travel all the world and make money. I'm just so grateful. So, yeah, anyone who needs help doing that, let hit me up, read Raf's book, talk to me, whatever, because the more people in power to live their best life the better it is for everybody so get it everyone get out there and get it and pilates is such a wonderful medium through which to do that hell yeah it's amazing yeah thank you for your time raf thank you nathan great to talk to you as always see you soon my friend see you soon